Good evening all. It's so good to see all your faces and thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, tonight's talk is about the Ascension. Now, some of you weren't here for mass, so you didn't hear a bit of my promo. But the whole idea about this talk is, this is me trying to show you how the Ascension is actually putting all of us on mission. It's not just about Christ resurrecting into heaven. And I'm going to be asking you some questions along the way. So please do not hesitate to share your answers and please do not be shy. In particular, Angie. <laughs> With that, we just had a beautiful mass. And oh, and it, oh we go. With that, we just had a beautiful mass. It was probably one of the best ways to ever start a talk. But in saying that, when it comes to heavyweight talks like this, it's best to ask for our Lord the Holy Spirit to come and bless us. So I'm ask you please to be upstanding so we may pray for some guidance. In the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy his consolations. In Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord, the Holy Spirit, please guide us to be able to focus throughout this talk. So we may treat this information and set ourselves on our mission. Mary, Mother of the Church, pray okay, for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you all. Amen. So my boy, once again, welcome to the talk. Now, so just going through the whole ascension, I want to let you all know that we're particularly covering the version that is present within the Acts of the Apostles. So we heard the Gospel of Mark. There's also a version present in the Gospel of Luke. We're going to be focusing on a few verses from the Acts of the Apostles just to show you all how jam-packed this part actually is. So with that, let's give it a quick read. So this starts from verse 6 in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up towards heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as he saw him go into heaven. That's all we're covering. Now, the first question I have for all of you, put you all on the spot. What happened at the ascension? And yes, this is a trick question, just to let you know. Because a lot of us think it's very basic, but what happened at the ascension? I want to see your creative juices flowing. <laughs> start, with some, start with some basic answers. It's okay if we start with the basic. Jesse? Jesus went up into heaven. <laughs> Fantastic start. So Jesus went up to heaven. I would have a whiteboard and write, but I don't, so pretend that I did. Jesus ascended into heaven. What else happened? Well, two angels came. Two angels came. Fantastic. Thank you, Jane. Were, were the heavens open? Uh, it doesn't particularly depict this in the Acts of the Apostles. But that would be crackable to see, I must say. <laughs> he gave his apostles a mission. Beautiful. Thank you, Laura. He gave him a mission. Fantastic. And gave us the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. Thank you, Laura. He also gave us the Holy Spirit. Talks about the end. The end, yeah. Mm -hmm. Christ did mention the end times. <laughs> He's ready for the trick. You are. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to see if anybody will. That's okay. If you didn't pick it up, it's perfectly fine. Because I used to read this countless times. I used to think it's quite literally just Christ ascending, a bunch of angels rock up, tell them about, you know, he'll come back eventually. And that's about the end of the story. We pack up and we go home. Uh, but unfortunately, it's oh, not unfortunately, but unfortunately for you lot, because you got to listen to me, it's actually got so many more layers. So let's begin. Let's begin with the first part. Uh, uh, I have an answer. Sorry. Sorry. Um, 
the like all of the people have witnessed it, like the apostles or, the, or his disciples, they witnessed it. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. So there was witnesses to the ascension, which is fantastic. Yeah. Thank you very much, Josephine. <laughs> Just call <Okay>. you know. <laughs> 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 so I want to stress something. I know some of you weren't at the mass, which is perfectly fine. But for those of you that were, if you listen to the say, and sorry if I didn't pronounce it right or chant it correctly, but in the say we say something that's quite profound. Oh Christ, by your ascension, you ended your stay on earth, completed your plan of salvation, and returned to the Father to prepare a place for us so that we may be where you are. Now a lot of us think that Christ crucified, resurrected, and then the ascension is kind of like him just showing off. <laughs> it's actually a fundamental part of his salvific plan. And that's kind of the scene that I want to set here. It's actually vital. Without it, you're going to see that a few things would actually be missing from our theology in particular and from Christian theology, basically speaking. I have a question. Once again, simple answers are following. Who is Jesus? It's a nice, simple question. Who is he? He's God. Fantastic. Very good. He's our Savior. Fantastic. Thank you. He's your friend as well. Lord. Thank God for that. <laughs> Anything else? He's the Son of God. Sorry, what was that, Laura? He's the Son of God. Son of God. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay. Image of God. Image of God. Fantastic. No problem at all. Boom. Now, I want you all to notice something. This is Christ. You all kind of focused on his divine nature. Yes. And you kind of forgot about the fact that he's also human. Now, a little bit of Christology, and this is very important. It's not as if he's half God and half man. Now, I just want to set the scene. Consider his two natures are fully present. And they're chained together in the person of Christ. So he's 100% God, but he's also simultaneously 100% man. Let that just sink in for a moment. He's human. Okay? He's also God, 100%. But he's also human. He took that human nature and he took it up to heaven. Could have dropped it. Could have left it. We could have been like the Gnostics and said it really didn't really exist. But he took it up with him. What does that tell us? At a very basic level, God cherishes humanity so much. That's like literally the first lesson that we get from the ascension. He loves us so much that the very nature that he took on, he took it up into heaven. That means it, we should be treating it like quite important, right? Should be a pretty top-notch thing. But the reason why this is so fundamental is when you think about the fact that our human nature is currently in the heavenly kingdom, and then you look at how society treats human nature, you recognize what the ascension is actually doing. It's getting us on mission to start treating us, our humanity and us humans with respect. Seriously, think about modern society. Euthanasia. If you're old, Whatever. Let's just deck you and get it over and done with. That's euthanasia in a nutshell. I had the privilege of speaking to Monica Duman, who's a writer in the Catholic Weekly. In Canada, where they have legalized euthanasia, insurance companies now refuse to pay for palliative care for those who are dying. They will pay for the pill to kill them, but they won't pay for their care in the hospital. Why? Because it's too expensive. Mm -hmm. The pill cost them 12 cents. To look after them will cost them thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening. And the ascension is telling us, hey, get back on track. We need to be treating our nature with a lot more respect. Mm -hmm. This one's a big one for me, abortion. Seriously. We're kind of literally dead the kids now. Like that, that's what we're doing. And we're doing that because we kind of forgot about this. See, in our mission, we're kind of always orientating towards the spiritual. We're almost inwards a lot of time. And there's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes we tend to forget that our mission is also for the physical. Now, where does this come from? And how do we learn to garner a bit more? And I'm 
I'm going to do a bit of promotion, but that's okay. This is literally covered, this kind of stuff. Simon Cowie's been studying the theology of the body. That's what the theology of the body covers. It covers how we ought to be cherishing our bodies in light of the teachings of our church passed on by our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the first very simple one, because we're going to get theologically heavy after this. But the first simple one I want to give to you all, the ascension is teaching us to start actually looking after our physical selves simultaneously. Very simple way to start, right? Any questions? Are we okay? <laughs> okay. Everyone online? You all sweet? <clears throat> yeah, good. Thanks. Thank you, Josephine. Okay. Yeah. Now, let's talk about our mass a bit. I know some of you wanted the mass, but this is a very common prayer that we pray for in the mass. You remember the priest saying this once you kind of get into the routine. Merciful and holy Lord and Father, through your only begotten Son, you have prepared the spiritual banquet for us. Accept the offering of this bloodless sacrifice and grant us the gift of your Holy Spirit. Okay, let's stop there for a moment. Did anything jump out at you all? Anything really compel you when you were reading that? Oh, wait, it's okay. Beautiful. So then I have a question for you all. How is it a sacrifice? It's a legit question. Because he already died on the cross, right? Kind of already sacrificed himself. How's it a sacrifice? How is what happens in that a sacrifice? sacrifice. Bloodless well, sacrifice, you can say whatever. How is it a sacrifice? Is it the divine nature of the divine nature of Jesus? Of the body of the human being. Mm. Inseparable. The hypostatic union. Person of Christ is there, no questions mm -hmm. asked. But good try. <laughs> it can be tough. It's a very tough question. Yeah. And the reason why I wanted to put it in here, because as I was kind of putting this talk together, I was thinking, man, we kind of hear this prayer all the time. And we don't really think about how is it a bloodless sacrifice? How is it a sacrifice of it? Did anybody on Zoom say anything? Yeah, sorry, just quickly. Uh, Justin said, because he is the lamb slaughtered for us. Beautiful. He is the lamb slaughtered for us. And, and Justin, I agree with you 100%. But he was already slaughtered. Mm -hmm. Are we implying that we're killing him again? Mm -hmm. Seriously, think about the implication. If we say that we're killing him again, we're saying that that wasn't good enough. We have, we have to do it over and over and over again. Than, obviously, it's more than a remembrance. We're not just doing mm. it in the re remembrance. I'm just it's trying still to a full sacrifice. It's more than remembrance. Absolutely. We state that it is a sacrifice. Mm. And no offense Nobody to that. Nobody remembers my whole part talk on the Eucharist. Like, I, we did this one for like half an hour. Yeah. I was there. Yeah, but I Sorry. remember. <laughs> I, I, <don't> <laughs> I remember watching that talk, but I can't remember. This is actually one of the, um, like with our Protestant brothers and sisters, with all due respect, this is actually one of the parts that they kind of, yeah. not argue, but, yeah, because yeah. they'll, they'll ask, like, how is it a sacrifice? Like, I thought, this is good enough, in which, like, logically speaking, it makes perfect sense. That is good enough. So we're stating as Catholics, it's another sacrifice, but how? That's a tough question. Yeah. Okay, Jim? I don't know. <laughs> That's fine. I wonder if the laser... Yeah, the laser point actually works on this thing. That's why I said Thank you, God. <laughs> Sorry, everyone on, online. When yes. you say how's a sacrifice, what do you mean how's a sacrifice? Okay. Is on the cross or... To, no, no, to, no, in the mass. In the mass. Because we the say... Is the sacrifice. Right? We say, yeah. accept the offering of this bloodless sacrifice. And he's holding up the gifts, right? So, in other words, how is it... And I'm so excited to use this point. Huh? How is it a bloodless sacrifice? Because it's perfect. It is a perfect sacrifice, is that but uniting us with him, like we receive him, or is that what you mean? Or... No. no, I'm just simply asking, how is it a sacrifice? Yeah, right. you're gonna tell us. I'm gonna tell you. Let's go. I, I was waiting to see if somebody would like. <laughs> I can tell you, but that, yeah, no, that, 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 you're not, like I can tell you too, but that's not the point. Okay, <laughs> you are gonna tell me. What do you mean? Yeah, well, I ain't gonna tell you. Anyway, <laughs> anyways, sorry to everyone online. We're kind of going back and forth for tonight. So, 
want you all to think about it like this, okay? This is a very important one. Acts 1, verse 9. We just read this. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Now, I know what you think. Seriously, Stefan, a cloud <coughs> is the answer to why it's a sacrifice? It's not just the cloud, but I want to kind of journey through the scriptures with you all. When you think about cloud and you search it up in the Bible, there's prominent places where it comes up, but none other than Exodus and Numbers in particular. Listen to Exodus. This is chapter 24, verses 15 to 16. Then the Moses, then Moses, the Moses, then Moses went up on the mountain and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord, I'm so excited. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the cloud. Let's keep building on it. Numbers chapter nine. On the day the tabernacle was set up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of the covenant, and from evening until morning, it was over the tabernacle, having the appearance of fire. Now, I know you all know what's a tabernacle. So what's a tabernacle? Oh, yeah, you keep it in there. Beautiful. You keep God in the tabernacle. Yeah, you keep <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. Yeah, like when you dumb down like that, it actually, it's actually kind of funny. We keep God in the tabernacle. It's actually crazy when you think about it. Anyways. Well, especially in the Old Testament. Especially in the book in the Old Testament, it's definitely there. When you think about the tabernacle, you're talking about the Holy of Holies. You're talking about where the Ark of the Covenant would have been kept. And according to Jewish teaching, that had the Spirit of God dwelling within it. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about a cloud, you're talking about sanctuary. You're talking about a place where the spirit of God is present. And then all of a sudden, you read Acts again, if we can go back, and you see cloud, and you're like, hold on a second, Christ is going somewhere. He's going to the Holy of Holies. Mm -hmm. Now, us Catholics are thinking he's going to the tabernacle, in which he is, 100%. There's a lot more than that. And I want us all to read Hebrews chapter 9. This is, this is when it gets crazy. Hebrews chapter 9. But when Christ came as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and perfect tent, tabernacle. not made with hands, tabernacle, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, not with the blood of goats and cows, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. What's it talking about? Where did he go? It, it, it's not a true question. We're talking about the ascension. He went to heaven. Yeah, heaven, in accordance to our theology, is a lot more than just a place. Even though, like, you know, we're going to break it down a bit more than that. It's quite literally the perfect tent. It's a sanctuary. It's a temple. It's where he goes to offer sacrifice. We hear it. We read it in Hebrews chapter seven. Consequently, he is able for all time to save those who approach God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them wait a minute i thought you just sac got sacrificed once what's he interceding for anymore seriously if i was jesus christ i'd be putting my feet up thinking man i've done a lot i can and that's it believe it or that right but hebrews is saying no he's constantly making intercession intercession with what have you ever thought about the fact that the ascension he ascends with the wounds mm. Have you ever thought about the fact that he resurrects with the wounds, the very wounds that he was nailed to the cross, and that's where they form, and that's where the ultimate sacrifice was performed? Why did he resurrect with it? Why did he ascend with it? This is when we start to get into the sacrifice. And I'm sorry, this is going to get a bit heavy for you all, but hear me out. You're Jesus Christ, okay? I want you to all just imagine for a second that you're Jesus Christ. And you've got your wounds, including your side piece. Now, when you died on the cross, what day did you die on? Okay. What time did you die? Good, pop quiz. I just want to make sure you got that. Okay? The room's awake. Thank you, God. He died under time, right? He died at a specific time. Friday at three o'clock. That's when he died. That's what we can say. So if you think about time as like a line, he died here on earth. He's underneath time. There's that specific time. There's a dilemma though. Is there time in heaven? 
No, right? It's eternal. He enters into heaven, which is not just a place that has a very long time or an infinite amount. It's got no time at all. It's a constant now, which is crazy to think about itself. So then what does that mean? Just imagine you're in a place that has no time. It's a constant now. And you're continually offering to the Father your wounds for all of eternity. His wounds, his body, his sacrifice has now become eternal. Eternal sacrifice. Eternal sacrifice. Get it? You're following it? It's okay. We can keep building on it. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Joseph. You just blew my It keeps bag. going. It keeps going, right? Where did Christ die? Calvary. Beautiful. Calvary. What's the name of the mountain that you traveled off? Yes. Go, go, go. It's okay. We're all waking up. It's fine. That's a space, right? Location. It's a location, a specific location. He was nailed to the cross from Calvary on the top of Mount Golgotha. So if you think about space as a line, once again, he's earth, we're under space. Is there any space in heaven? No. Not a single one. No. I love this image right here. When he's up in the holy sanctuary of heaven, what's he offering up? His wounds. Mm. He's literally got nothing else in his hands. It's just his wounds. His sacrifice, his wounds, yeah, what he has gone through has become timeless and it's become spaceless. That's why us Catholics have the audacity to say that when the priest celebrates Mass, it is a sacrifice, but not a re-sacrifice. Mm. It's a representation of that same sacrifice. Why? Because he is now timeless and spaceless. We can represent the same body that was crucified, resurrected, glorified. Mm. Crazy, right? Yeah. Utterly insane. Now, the good thing is, I'm about to explain another term for you that I remember once, Jamie, you asked. The Son of Christi, in the person of Christ, we say that within Catholic theology. To briefly explain, what we implicate is the priest, when he's celebrating Mass, when he's hearing confession, he is acting in the person of Christ. What does that mean? Christ is now timeless and spaceless, eternal, as we've all said. That means, in a very mysterious way, that almost in a very simplified way of explaining it, when the priest celebrates Mass, so is he. But because he's eternal, because he's now in heaven, which is spaceless, it means it doesn't matter where the Mass is celebrated. It doesn't matter if it's celebrated 50 times simultaneously in 50 different <coughs> points across the world. It's still his body and blood, soul and divinity, on that altar, presented in the form of bread and blood. What does that teach us? What does that tell us? He bloody loves you, man. Like in a very simple term, he really loves you. Because he's still offering himself up. The cross is enough. I want to make this abundantly clear. If he just died on the cross, he is God. He can do whatever he wants. He could have just left it at that. But instead, he's kept on going. So what does that teach us about the ascension? We ought to keep on going as well. Surround yourself with his love as much as conceivably possible. But also, don't take anything for granted. When we say blood is sacrifice, don't just stand there and be like, yeah, I agree. And not just think about it. Actually think about it. Because when you do, <laughs> it just makes you fall more in love with this guy. Honestly. Now, I know that was a bit theologically deep. Is everyone okay? Everyone online? Are we all okay? Any questions at all? We're good. Okay, beautiful. All of this that we just said right now, believe it or not, is presented within our Maronite Mass. Believe it or not. Let's have a look. Okay? We all know the Eucharistic prayer. 
Yeah, we all know how it starts. Ready? I bet you you all know the response. Pretend I'm on Sydney Shore. All right, and I'm at the altar and I lift up my cross and I say, Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. What do you respond back with? Beautiful. Do you know that's actually not entirely correct? In the English, at least. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not entirely correct. In Arabic, it's different. In, in Arabic, which the Syriac is probably a bit closer, or what, the Arabic is closer to the Syriac, yeah. if that makes sense. It actually says in Arabic, and sorry if I butchered this, Inna ha la deka, la in ya la deka ya Allah. You know what that roughly actually translates to into English? Mm -hmm. The other thing is, is not. The literal translation is, indeed, they are before you, O God. What's the difference here? As you're there, that talk on Tuesday. We're going to keep building on this. The difference is, this one's saying that we're lifting them up as we speak. The Arabic is actually saying, they're already there. Okay. Give me a, how does that work? This is where it's going to get mind blown. And this is why the ascension is so important. We're going to keep building on, all right? Some parts after this, we sing a hymn. Holy, 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 mighty Lord God of oh, hosts. Beautiful. I have a question. And as you're not allowed to answer because you were there on Tuesday. And for those of you on Tuesday, you're not allowed to answer either. Do you have any idea where we get this from? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, beautiful. Where? Where are the angels? At the altar. Oh. Where do we read that? Come on, Alex, come on. <laughs> You're almost there. Which book? Which book in the Bible? Revelation. No. Oh, yeah. That and? Come on. Come on. Take it back a bit. No. <laughs> uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Keep on back. Keep on back. <laughs> no, no. Keep on going. Keep on going. What's? It's New Testament, right? No. It's, it's, no, it's Old Testament. Let me put it this way. What's the one book that probably prophesied about the sacrifice of Christ the most? Isaiah. Bingo. Isaiah. Read this. Yeah. Okay. Ready? Read this. This is from chapter six. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. This is the prophet Isaiah, who's currently having a vision, and he's there upon the throne of the Lord. He's envisioning heaven. High and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. So we know he's talking about heaven. Each had six wings. With two, he covered his face, and with two, he covered his feet, and with two, he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, hear me out. With all of this in mind, what's the Maronite mass trying to actually tell us? And this comes from Father Yohanna Aziz's book, mind you. Introduction to the Maronite Faith. Heaven and earth. And this is the only picture I could find that could come close to it. Are starting to mingle. Yeah. I remember Dad drew this for me. Ago. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. In the Holy Maronite Mass, we are stating that heaven and earth <laughs> are beginning to mingle. Any questions so far? This is going to be. All right. Just a note on the holy, holy, holy. Can you turn on the mic? So oh, sorry. Can't hear you, Rod. Quick <laughs> <laughs> note on the holy, holy, Stop. holy. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Quick <laughs> note on the holy, holy, holy. It's also a prayer that the church has had since the apostles. Because it is a prayer that comes from the Jewish synagogue. <coughs> uh, prayer time in the Jewish synagogue. Crack up. So all of the all the big names of Christianity, Jews, yeah, Jesus, you know that Jesus, yeah. Mary, Joseph, Peter, James, John, yeah. So that's and when you see a lot of the really old prayers that were in the original liturgies that come to us from through the apostles, first century. A lot of the key prayers are actually come straight through from from what the prayers that Jesus would have sang in synagogue when they were worshiping. Yeah, just let you know. Thank you very much, Max. Which came from Isaiah. Yes. 
This is super important. We're going to keep on building, all right? So if I lose anybody, you have to let me know because we're going to keep on building, okay? I want you all to listen to a beautiful hymn by St. Ephraim. I will introduce you some Syriac theology right now. This is his second hymn on the Nativity. Okay? I know we're going a bit back, but that's okay. It implicates exactly the same thing. Blessed be that child who gladdened Bethlehem today. Blessed be the babe who made manhood young again today. Blessed be the fruit who lowered himself to our famished state. Blessed be the good one who suddenly enriched our this is a big word. Necessitousness and supply. Um, that's a humongous word. Necessitousness. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, <Robert. laughs> Just tell us that. I like. I reckon the Syriac that sounds so much better. <laughs> yeah. Blessed he whose tender mercies made him condescend to visit our infirmity. Saint Ephraim is talking about something here, and the best explanation that I could find was from this wonderful theologian, his name is Sebastian Brock. Pick up his book. Fantastic stuff. And he really builds on Syriac theology. Listen to what he says. Ephraim is making two basic points. Since humanity cannot cross the ontological chasm and so approach God, and ontology is a big word, but philosophically speaking, ontology is the study of existence and nature. Okay? God has to cross it on the opposite direction first. Only thus can communication be established. You know, Brock is making a radical call here. He's saying that if this didn't happen, if Christ didn't become man, if he didn't ascend, we wouldn't have our mass. We wouldn't have our form of communication. It's a radical call. God has to descend to humanity's lowly level and address that humanity in its own terms and language. And secondly, the whole aim of this divine descent into human language is to draw humanity up to God. Or in other words, divinization. Mm. That slow divinization that we constantly bring up. Mm. This is in our Maronite Mass. I want to, want to keep going. All right? This is our Maronite Mass. We all know this part. You have united a Lord, your divinity, with our humanity, and our humanity with your divinity. Listen. Let me just make this simple. For Jewish people, if they heard this, uh, they would have stoned the bloke on the spot if he said that. That's blasphemy. God becoming man. Let's keep going. Your life with our mortality and our mortality with your life. You have assumed what is ours and you have given us what is yours for the life and salvation of our souls. To you be glory forever. Not only in descent, but in his ascension, he has lifted us up with him. Crazy when you think about it. I'm not going to stop like that, though, because it keeps on going. The priest, when he lifts up the gifts, this is just before the prayer for communion. What does he say? Holy things for the holy. He says gifts, doesn't he? Not singing? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm. Holy gifts for the holy. Holy gifts for the holy. Yeah. I guess this old, is that's the old term. Yeah, yeah. and that's for the twelve apostles. Yeah. 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 Anyways, thank you, Jen. <laughs> that's okay. No problem. He's calling you holy. He's calling us holy. It's not just like he's lifting up. He's giving it to you. Holy things for the holy. But how did that occur? And why did that happen? That happened. Because he assumed our human nature and he ascended with it into heaven. Yeah. And don't go past that. Let Rob build on the one. Holy things for the holy. I just wanted to bring it up. The Hagia e Hagia on Greek comes from the first liturgy, one of the oldest pieces of writing that we have on the liturgy. First century, yeah. yes, first century, written that, I think, 62 AD. So before some, before everything in the Bible was written, there's yes. a um, fragment that we have, which has those words, Tahagia Akagia, in Greek, right? It's from the liturgical book that, they, that the apostles and the early church had, okay? That's how far back that goes. That's the liturgy. 
Holy things for the holy. Tahagia means holy thing, yeah, or holy gifts for the holy. That comes to us by God. Mm -hmm. Rise of the wow. It is. It's, it, it, so to think from that point in Jerusalem, where, where the gospel spread, yeah, where the message has spread, the liturgy has spread, and they've kept that. And 2,000 years later, mm. we're still saying the same thing. Do you go back to the earliest Maronite liturgies that we have? 1,500 years ago, still saying the same thing. Go back to the apostles right at the beginning, they're still saying the same thing. It keeps on going. And it's all built off the theology that we found in the century. This idea that our humanity has been elevated into heaven. Mm -hmm. Like what, what I'm trying to say to you is, seriously, the ascension is really important. Mm -hmm. Like it's not just Christ going up to heaven. This is fundamental for our theology. Now granted, he could have done it another way. I'm not trying to say that God couldn't do it another way. But what we're trying to say is in what he's revealed to us, it's built our theology. And we've known it since the get-go. Matter of fact, uh, Scott Hahn speaks about it so beautifully. He says, I think it's in the Gospel of Mark where the apostles, after the ascension, they go to the temple. And they start worshipping. They go to the temple because they're recognizing something. They've recognized that they've just witnessed Christ ascend into the Holy of Holies. So they've gone to worship him. What they knew is the Holy of Holies. That link there. And that's what our church is. That's what Mass is attempting to do. It's the linking of heaven and earth. Cracker, <laughs> I bet you would never look at the Maronite Mass the same. Yes. And can we have another look at that painting? Absolutely. Like Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. There's one more point I really want to stress to you. Okay. <laughs> I love this bit. This was actually, this sticks out to me the most. Acts 1, 10 to 11. While he was going and they were gazing up towards heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? It's almost as if to a way they rebuked him. Why are you looking up? This Jesus who has been taken up from you to heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Why are they so ticked off with him looking up into heaven? <laughs> I thought that's what we're kind of meant to orientate towards. Why I thought they were always meant to be moving towards heaven. Why are they ticked off with looking up towards heaven? Not ticked off. I don't really think angels can get ticked off. But that's going on. That's another theological discussion. Yeah. Technically, they might be able to. Maybe. I feel like they get ticked off in like a spiritual way. Why are they getting ticked off? Oh, it's because they have a. They need to look at the earth and fulfill their mission. Hot. Cracker, Jesse. That's a fantastic answer. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's it. That's it. What are you still Sorry, what did you she say? Oh, get to it. She said, <laughs> Jesse, can you repeat it? Can you repeat it? Basically, they need to look at the earth and fulfill their earthly mission. It's, <laughs> it's that. Like in a very simple, famous term, but it's even more than that as well. Here's the next radical call The Our Father. We all know that prayer, right? We all pray the Our Father. It doesn't matter what Christian denomination you are. Everybody prays the Our Father. One of the most radical calls within the Our Father is, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Mm -hmm. Not, Thy will be done in heaven, or let's just move towards, Thy will be done here as it is in heaven. This has united the will of earth and heaven. That's why when the angels are telling him, Why are you looking up? Look forward. Mm -hmm. Where do you think we get the saying heaven on earth? It's from this. The ascension. It's quite literally us saying, hey, you're not meant to be just looking up to heaven saying, hey, how's... you're meant to be trying to bring heaven here to humanity. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's, yeah. That's what the ascension is trying to do. The ascension is trying to get us to do that. That's why Christ ascended his humanity into heaven. Because by elevating the humanity, he's trying to tell us, hey, this is what you can achieve. Go out there and tell the world. So he does it. And how does he do it? We built on baptism. If you're there for my talk on the hemorrhaging woman, I built on baptism. <coughs> this is quite literally 
everything that you get from baptism. Look at what you get. You get the ability to believe in God, to hope in him and to love him through the theological virtues. He gives you that at baptism. He gives the ability, the power to live and act under the prompting of the Holy Spirit through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, allowing them to grow in goodness through the moral virtues. All of this starts from baptism. What a radical call by the catechist, by the way. Thus, the whole organism of the Christian supernatural life has its roots in baptism. It starts there. But the baptism has its authority, has its power, has its mission from the ascension. Look at the gifts that you get. Christ ascends to heaven. What does he say to them? I have to go. Why do you have to go? Because then he will send you. And what does the advocate give you? He doesn't want us to just be already taking all the time towards heaven. Don't get me wrong. Your spiritual health is very important. I want to make that abundantly clear. Praying is a very fundamental aspect. But we're Christians. We ought to get out there and we ought to try and change the world. We ought to make disciples. We ought to get out there and actually fulfill our mission. And the ascension is telling us, hey, get going. Smooth, what else do I have here? That's the concluding part. So that's the three points. This one, the ascension. Mind you, we didn't even cover all. Like, there's so much more to this spot. Just from three points, what do you got? Your humanity has been uplifted. You're not just a, even though science is talking, you're not just an evolved ape on a piece of rock spinning around the universe, yeah? <laughs> you're a human being, you say. Yeah. <laughs> I want to be an ape spinning on a rock in the middle of the universe. <laughs> you're more than that. That's why when this world tries to keep uh, bringing us down with nothing more, <laughs> meaninglessness, abortion, euthanasia, you name it, we're meant to be saying, you're so much more. And the second thing is the mass. The mass, as we know it, has its roots in the ascension. It's the mingling of heaven and earth. Lastly, it's the uniting of their wills. In other words, and, and I know what Sun Shaw has been stressing this a lot, we have to be disciples. Now, just sitting around doing nothing, the ascension calls us towards mission. And he gives us, like, literally everything. Like, it's quite astonishing to think about how much he's actually giving us. Any questions? That was a bit, that was a jam-packed 40 minutes. Is everyone okay? Yes. We survived. Yeah, thank you, God. I want to um, just tell you all about resources before we do the concluding prayer, just, just in case you need to do it. So, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Uh, this is the St. Paul's edition. And the beautiful appendix of this book. <laughs> beautiful appendix. Uh, I never thought I'd say that sentence. But anyways, in the index, <laughs> it's got the scriptural verses for you and the catechism and the catechism, the, verse, the verse that it leads towards. Okay? So if you ever want to know about the stuff, come here. <laughs> it's really simple. It actually makes it really simple for you. You read the verse and you ever think, man, I wonder what Catholics teach about that. Come here, and then it'll guide you towards that. And then, yeah, trust me. And we've got a couple of copies here if anybody wants to get them. Lastly, and I said this on Tuesday, as honestly, and I know this might be a radical call, but I don't know how you feel about this. If you just read this, I actually wouldn't have a single concern for your salvation whatsoever. I'd be really confident. Not just reading it, but doing it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's actually phenomenal what is in here. That is a, there's a lot of theology. A lot of theology. A bit of a radical in, call, but I just want to just... That, that yes. is our yes. corner, our that's nice our, that's our yeah. Yeah. So all of our Syriac early theology is pretty much contained in that book. So there's a lot of them. Okay. But they need to have a, a session on how to use that book. So I used to go to 7 o'clock mm. in the morning, and mm. I... I, I bought the book for that reason. But now I don't use it because it's overhead. But it's so hard. You guys need to emphasize what page. <laughs> for everyone online, by the way, Esmeralda was just saying that we need to have a session on how to use the book. I agree 100%. Yeah, the liturgical book. Yeah. We're working on that. Yeah. We're working on that. The thing about the Maronite Mass, and, and before we get to our concluding prayer, I just want to stress this. You would think that it'd be simple to structure a talk on the Maronite 
It's actually not that simple. Because the more you read this, the more you learn, and then the more you want to teach other people, and then you're stuck in this infinite loop of just adding more and more information to your talk, and the next thing you know, you've got a talk that goes on for six years. <laughs> and we don't have the time and resources for that just yet. So we're working on it. No, no, it's, yeah. it's maths. Like, if it's during the month or the week, it's different. It changes all the time. Oh, you're talking about like the actual liturgical. Yeah, yeah. I would recommend. Uh, do you have a calendar at home? No, I yeah, it, you can follow that as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, it has the liturgical stuff on it. Yeah. Anyways, let's say I conclude Brent and then we'll open it up to questions and Jamie will read by the way that, that <laughs> picture that you like. This is a prayer uh, for the Ascension and it's inspired on setting us in the mission. So we're about to pray. And Father, Son, Holy Spirit, yeah. Amen. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, Right before your ascension into heaven, you told your apostles to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth upon receiving the Holy Spirit. May I be similarly inspired to spread your gospel message in word and deed, according to your will for me. And may I do so prudently and joyfully with your help, your guidance, and your grace. And remembering this glorious event, Help me to seek what is above, heaven, where you are seated at the right hand of God. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Name, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. All.